أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى آل الطيبين الطاهرين ال Ma'asumin al-Mazlumin. All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in His blessed name, the Almighty Lord who created us and out of His infinite mercy has kept for us an eternal existence due to His infinite mercy and He has put us on this earth for a very short period of time and there is only one obligation we have on this earth while all the others are secondary matters which is to acquire wealth, security in terms of the material sense but the real objective of our existence on this earth for the transient nature that we've been brought to on this earth is precisely for us to recognize his mercy and to take ourselves and to improve it and take it closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that process will ultimately take us to higher stations because we will have participated in the mercy of God which is truly one of the greatest mercies of God which is the ability for this created being to practice free will and to take that free will towards God. For the free will can also take one away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is called jahil. Ignorance takes you away from Allah, aql in the heart, the true nature takes you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tonight, as we continue this discussion about the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam on this very, very important month, which is the Shahrullah, the month of God, Shahru Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان. I mean, this month is just nothing but mercy. It's filled with mercy, mercy, mercy for humanity, for the entire human race. For when the Quran was revealed in this month, it is for the human race. This book, the Quran, is for humanity, not for the believers, but is for all of mankind. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has also instituted fasting for us so that we improve ourselves for the objective that we all have to um, achieve is that we must abstain from that which takes us away from Allah because the synonym is similar. If something takes us away from Allah, the implication is the same as self-destruction. So if someone was to say that I'm self-destructing, it means you're going away from Allah. <clears throat> if you're self-progressing, and securing the self and growing and taking it to higher stations and giving it more power, then that individual is actually getting closer to Allah. So when we say we must do things for, the, for Allah, for example, we can also say we must do things for the ultimate good. For the ultimate good is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when people say, I want to be a good person, what they're saying is, I want to get closer to Allah in the truest of meanings. And if someone says, I want to get close to Allah, Allah, it means I want to be a good person. I want to do good. There is no other way to cut this. And today, tonight, as we commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam, while he is lying in his house and the poison is seeping into his body, and he leaves us with gems of uh, guidance, not only for the 63 years that he was, but for his last moments, he is encapsulating all, everything that will be essential for you and I to remember, for nothing stays longer with us than when somebody is about to die. You will see that when somebody is about to breathe their last, what they say has the most profound effect to us. We humans tend to value people when they're about to leave us. We tend to value things when we're about to lose them or when we've lost them. But we, we tend to value those things, we pay attention. It's like you don't pay attention to your loved one, but when they're in the hospital, they're about to die. Every breath that they take is important to us. Every sentence that is uttered is important to us. So Imam Ali alayhi salam capitalizes on that to ensure that not only was he 63 years of incredible foundational work that will continue to perpetuate and grow this religion, so that it continues to grow and it will become the, the de facto religion of God on earth, the majority. For still, 
people are confused. Still, people are claiming Jesus is the Son of God. Still, people think idols are the means to God. Still, people think there's no need for God. Still, people who do believe in Islam somehow may not understand its full dynamics. All of these are growth factors that will continue to grow. And inshallah, when our living Imam reappears soon, you will see that that will be brought to its ultimate completion. And we as a human race will truly understand the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. In the meantime, we have history. We have tremendous history, history that cannot be changed. In other words, you and I are blessed with events that took place permanently ensconced in the annals of history for you and I to examine and to use it as a means by which to strengthen our Iman today and tomorrow. So this commemoration of Imam Ali alayhi salam is inexhaustible, for we can talk about his wisdom, about his strength, about his submission to Allah, his kindness and love for humanity. I mean, I can go on and on. His obedience, absolute obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as to the Holy Prophet. I mean, this man did not blink, utter, move outside of the frequency of the divine, that Allah loves him so much that everywhere in the Quran where Allah says, you know, ya ladina amanu, wherever ladina amanu Allah mentions, it is referring to the finest form is Amir al-Mu'mineen. And of course, in certain positions, only he has those verses. Like in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 55, you know, they give zakat in the state of ruku. That is only Amir al-Mu'mineen and no one else. Okay, and in the uh, verse number 207 of uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the one who is giving his life for the pleasure of God, you find all of these are exclusively mentioned for Imam Ali alayhi salam. Sure, there are others who followed within those uh, parameters, but no one holds the banner more than he does. Now, why do we speak this way? Well, because this is ibadah. When you and I want to reach perfection towards the Almighty Lord, if we do not look at such personalities who were impeccable in their behavior, who were infallible in their worship, who were infallible in their guidance towards us, then how would you and I ever understand what the dynamics of being, of reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You'll find that the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the finest role model. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He is the best role model. And Imam Ali alayhi salam, followed that footstep. And you will see that in his last moments, as the blessed Imam is talking to us, he's talking to his family, he's talking to his sons, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. There are so many writings. There's not enough time tonight to touch on all of them, but to get a gist of it. And we will talk about some of them. And, um, and we will see how worried the Imam was that while he's leaving, he's not worried about meeting his Lord. In fact, he's excited. He said, I am running because I'm going to go meet someone. Imam says, you know, to his family and to the people. That's how he felt that he wanted to leave this world when God calls him back. And he, he's just longing like the child who wants the milk of its mother. Imam says that death is like that to me. So while he's lying on his deathbed, let's take some lesson. Let's evaluate. Let's try to implement. And tonight we talk about the self. In Surah Al-Shams, Allah says, وَنَفْسِمْ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَالتَّقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Allah has laid a very strict foundation. The self which he perfected, he taught it wrong and right. Indeed, successful is the one who purifies it. Indeed, the one who will fail is the one who impurifies it. And the lessons we must take from Imam Ali alayhi salam tonight are precisely on how do we prevent the impurities and how do we increase the purities. Well, that is what life is all about. And I send condolences to the entire world, and tomorrow we'll continue this conversation. For me, we must never cease to mention him in all our lectures, never cease to mention Karbala in all our lectures, never cease to mention the struggles of the Holy Prophet in all our lectures. For without them, what good is it? For they are the very iconic figures and beings that will ignite our hearts towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe me, I've seen people who've lost their ways, who are confused. The most amazing thing is when they go for ziyarat, when they go visit the shrines of these imams and the prophet, they come back affected, either fully affected or partially affected. And I always wonder, what does a grave 
do to a person with such levels that 1400 years ago, these blessed figures left this world, and yet today we're still being affected. The, the, the haram of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, haram of Abbas alayhi salam, haram of Imam Rada in Mashhad, haram of Imam Ali alayhi salam. You'll find that in the haram and the graves of our four Imams in Jannatul Baqi. My God, just stand there. You can stand there to eternity. You know, when I go to Jannatul Baqi, it's like I don't want to leave. I just want to stay there forever. And I always wonder, it's a grave. What is it about this grave that makes me want to sit there? And that just that grave is such a reminder to in, infuse this nafs in me, the purity, and tells me, purify yourself. For we, we lie here as your role models and think about us. Just your thought about us will take you in the right direction. So this commemoration and the remembrance is ibadah. Anybody who tells us, no, we are talking about this too much, they have no idea what they're talking about. And just either gently ignore them or tell them, what the truth is, and hopefully they'll come that way. Allah in the Quran, you know, it's very beautiful because, you know, I need to quote this because this really sort of lays the foundation in Surah Tawbah. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 111, which is 9111. <clears throat> I'll Translated, يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَيَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ وَعْدًا عَلَيْهِ حَقًّا فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ وَالْقُرْآنِ وَمَنْ أَوْفَى بِأَهْدِي مِنَ اللَّهِ فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا بِبَيْعِكُمُ الَّذِي بَايَعْتُمْ بِهِ وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ And Allah continues, you know, but just as an introduction, we talk about Imam Ali alayhi salam. He is the embodiment. Look at this verse. Surely Allah has bought of the believers. Inna Allah ashtara min al mu'minin. How does Allah buy something he owns? Just think about it. Allah says, Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al mulk. Blessed is he in whose hand is the universe. Allah owns the universe. How does he buy when he owns it? Look at the honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. That while he owns us, he asks us if we want to give ourselves to him. When we say, salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Say, in the salati, my prayers, wa nusuki, my sacrifice, my, my prayers, everything, my life, my death, are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complete. Here Allah says, in Allah shtara. Allah has purchased from the believers, the persons, and their property. Not only the person, their property. They spend for the sake of Allah. You find Imam Ali alayhi salam would go and he would work for a Jewish uh, man. He would plant all these date trees and then he would make a lot of money and he was very efficient in what he did. And by the time he gets home, he just has enough money to feed his family. What happened with all the surplus? He gave it away to the needy, to the poor, because he has given his promise to him, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ That they struggle in the way of Allah with their wealth and their selves for the cause of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they shall have the garden, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised them high stations. Now I want you to understand our imams, and our prophets, especially the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did not worship Allah for paradise. I want you to understand that. They stated it, Imam Ali Alaihi Wasallam stated it unequivocally. He said, oh Allah, I don't worship you as a slave who is afraid to go to hell. Nor do I worship you as a businessman who does business with you so I can enter paradise. I worship you because you are worthy of worship. That last sentence is quintessential that many of us on earth are missing. Many a times we transact with Allah. If we pray, we want something from Allah. Sure, we should ask from Allah, but that's not why we should pray. We should pray because Allah has already given us the credit. This is just an, an acknowledgement of the credit that he has given us. Not that I'm going to pray so you give me something. Oh no, you and I can pray millions of prayers. We will never pay back what he has already given us. So let us not claim that when we pray, it's because we are praying to get 
uh, we are bargaining. I'm going to pray what you give me this. Allah says, no, no, no. You, you owe it to yourself. In ahsantum ahsantum li anfusikum. And when you do, yamunnun alayka an aslamu. Qul la tamunnu alayya islamakum. Balillahu yamunnu alaykum an hadakum lil iman. They, they think they're doing you a favor by submitting Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat. Allah says, no, 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 no. You're not doing me a favor. You're not doing us a favor. Rather, Allah is doing you a favor to guide you and to take you out of this ignorance. This is something you and I must hold on to. So that every dollar of charity we give, it should be, oh Allah, this is not enough. Sirran wa alaniya. You know, in secret, or in, in secret or in public. This verse, by the way, was revealed to Imam Ali about Imam Ali salam's charity, the way he was giving, sirran wa alani, Allah says. That's how much Allah loves Imam Ali salam. But you'll find people who give charity, they will put a rope around your neck. Remember, I gave you that money. Now, what favor are you going to do for me? You know, Hajj, remember, I helped you. I gave you that money. Didn't give it to me. He gave it for the cause of Allah. Yeah, but see, you were the, you know, and what favor? I said, Imam, Imam, Muhammad Bakr salam, says, when you give charity, and if you talk about it in any way, shape, or form that you've done it as a favor, you have destroyed its value. By the third time you speak, it's gone. On Judgment Day, you will wonder what happened to the value of the charity. Allah says, you got it because you claimed it. Allah in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah says, Kind speech and forgiveness is better than charity followed by injury. Did you ever see Imam Ali salam, ever do that? No. By the time he gets home, all his wealth is gone. Did he go knocking on the doors and say, by the way, I helped you, I helped you? Never, never, never stated that. In fact, one time there was a man who came into the house of Imam Ali salam, as he's eating, he's taking food and putting it in his pocket. Imam Hassan notices this. And Imam says, if you need this food, take it. You don't have to, you know, uh, gently put it in your pocket. He says, no, it's not for me. So Imam Hassan says, then who is it for? He said, for there's, there's a man who is so poor, poorer than me, I'm taking it for him. Imam Hassan says, describe me who this man is. Because Imam was very eager to help the poor. And he's describing Imam Ali, he says his clothes are torn, he's tattered. And Imam is looking at Imam Hassan and recognize this is his father. You know, sometimes there was just not enough food to feed the, the hungry. So the Imam would, would dim the lamp and he would almost, he would act like he's eating with this poor person. So the poor person does not feel bad. That's the opposite of the person who, who gives charity and then holds you liable. Imam Ali Islam is the opposite, where he dims the light in order to not make that poor person feel bad for there, is, there isn't enough food for both of them. How many people on earth do you and I know that will do that? Hmm? Imam Ali alayhi salam goes to the market. This one really takes it to another level. Kambar, as you know, was his servant in the house. Imam freed him, but Kambar would never leave. Kambar loved Imam Ali so much that he became shaheed because of Kambar. See? You know, Hajjaj bin Yusuf killed him and you find Qambar was such a loyal servant of Imam Ali. How? How did he become so loyal? Like Fiddah. Fiddah was the servant of Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayhi. I want us to imagine these personalities we are talking about. In the annals of history, you tell me. How many, those of us who have servants in our homes, I want you to imagine. I've seen people who have servants. They're in the different room. They eat leftover food. They're not given the good clothes. The leftovers, you know, take it. You know that Fidda knew the entire Qur'an and she never spoke with her own words after the Qur'an was revealed. What kind of a servant has time to memorize the Qur'an and to only answer with the Qur'an till she dies? And she's a servant of Fatima to Zahra, alayha. You want to understand Fatima, alayhi salam? Just study the, the, the servant of Fatima to Zahra, alayha. I am stunned in history that I've never seen a master who can train their servants such ways that their servants outshine the ordinary people in the community. Because that's the kind of love and charity you give. Imam Ali Alayhi takes Kambar and he buys two shirts, a used, an old one and a new one. Imam comes home and gives the new one to Kambar. You know what typically we would say? Oh, you are poor. You don't have it. I have it. 
So let me give something to you. God will be pleased with me. Typical people would say that. You know, rub it. Mashallah, you're giving, but rub it. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Qamr, you are young. You are young and uh, full of vigor. So this new dress looks better on you. Can you imagine the approach? And Imam takes the used clothes, the older one, and he wears it. This is the kind of personality we're talking about. The kind of personality who taught us the kind of values that you will not find in the annals of history. But these are the things not only for you and I to talk about and to feel good about it and to pat each other on the back and to say, mashallah, that was beautiful, that was very touching. Yes, alhamdulillah, it's touching and it'll continue to touch us. Just like going to the graves and visiting them is enough of a touch. No speech, no need, just behavior. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who are they? They give their selves, their wealth, everything. That they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way. Imam Ali alayhi salam, ever so willing to fight. If somebody's attacking the Prophet, he's the guardian. Even as a child in Mecca, anybody who threw rocks at the Prophet, he would counter back. Imam Ali alayhi salam would attack them and tell them, get away. That's how he would protect the Messenger of Allah. Ever so willing. If you say vigilant and strong as an intrepid being. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they slay and are slain. Hmm? They kill and they get killed. For what? A promise which is binding on him in the Torah, in the Injil, in the Quran. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid the foundation of these kinds of people since the creation of Adam. This law has never changed. That those who have done this are the best in Allah's eyes. And you find Imam Ali alayhi salam is elevated in this verse. Once again, you'll find in history, ask any five schools of thought, who was the flag bearer of Islam? Amir al-Mu'mineen. Who was the defender of Islam? Amir al-Mu'mineen. Who was the one who dislodged all the evil giants who came to destroy Islam? Amir al-Mu'mineen. You find history after history after history that even he stands on the shoulder of the Prophet and he breaks the idols of the Kaaba because they are one. Well, these two never bowed, and Khadija salam never bowed to any idols. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I guarantee these are my people. Rejoice therefore in the pledge which you have made, and that is the mighty achievement. And Allah continues, of course, but not enough time, just as an introduction. In continuity with this, I will, inshallah, in the discussion, discuss the brief statements of Imam Ali alayhi salam, the words of wisdom, we must ponder. My life, I've noticed whenever I get confused, I lose my way, I feel apathetic, I feel lazy, I don't feel like my vision is clear, I don't have the desire to do something right. I read the Quran or I read the Najul Balagh. I read the statements of Amir al-Mu'mineen and that is enough for me to understand the wisdom of this great man, and I feel so empowered. So I'd like to share, inshallah, when we start with this dialogue, uh, I will share some of these, but here's one example. Imam Ali alayhi salam is talking about knowledge and the wisdom that he has left us with knowledge. So I'll share one. He says, Imam is talking to Kumail ibn Ziyad. He says, people are of three types. One is the scholar and the divine, and then the seeker of knowledge who is also on the way of deliverance, then lastly, the common rot who run after every collar and bend in the direction of every wind. They seek no light from the effulgence of knowledge and do not take protection of any reliable support. So there are three kinds of people, the learned, the learner, and the rot. Imam Ali Islam said, they waste your time. They have no interest to learn and they have no interest to give. Unfortunately, it's sad, but the world has quite a few of that, unfortunately. And sometimes we complain about why we have problems in the world. And maybe it's because we've done it to ourselves due to our negligence. Many statements as such, Imam Ali alayhi salam talks. We will touch on it, inshallah, in this dialogue. Um, suffice it to say that when the Imam was breathing his last, and tomorrow I will read a lot of his um, last wills. But in a nutshell for tonight, as an introduction, the Imam would constantly say, obey Allah, do not associate anyone with him. Obey the Holy Prophet, for he is your way, and do not let these two separate from each other, ever, till you die. 
So if you want to succeed, hold on to this too. What a gift Imam Ali alayhi salam is leaving us that while he's leaving, these are the words. And when you listen to what he has to say, exact verbatim, word for word, you and I will really learn to appreciate. And I'm speaking to an audience today that knows these hadith and an audience that doesn't know and an audience that knows vaguely what it is. Wherever you lie in the spectrum, please understand. And I say this sincerely from the bottom of my heart. If you and I spend time to understand this great personality, and we really put our minds to this, you and I will be successful. People at the United Nations, they're not foolish when they recognize the wisdom and the hikmah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, for there is no man in history that has shown us after the Holy Prophet how to maintain the direction towards Allah as the ultimate gatekeeper of the city of knowledge. And it is upon us on these nights. And what better than in the nights of Qadr for you and I to reflect on this. May Allah bless us, inshallah, with Amal you continue, inshallah. Thank you, Brother Hassanain, for that introduction. And as we continue this discussion on the life and remembrance of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and especially through the lens of this spiritual struggle, this journey towards tranquility, this journey and self-struggle, the jihad and nafs that we talk about towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the principle of this nafs and the purification of the self and taking it towards God, a principle that Imam Ali alayhi salam was an exemplary manifestation of. The principle is laid in the Quran and the verses that were just mentioned, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this nafs, this inner self essence of our being that he has placed within us in Surah Shams. That he has placed this nafs within us. He perfected it. He completed it. He taught and inspired it to know right and wrong. The successful will be those who purify the self, meaning just having the self and just knowing the fact that Allah has inspired you and I to a level to know the difference between right and wrong is not sufficient. That's simply the foundation on which you and I need to build and extrapolate and grow upon. But then, in order to achieve success, you and I must refine and fine tune and purify the soul. And if we don't, then surely those who fail to do that will corrupt it. They will corrupt it. So you and I must work towards purifying, doing what we would call the tazkiyah to nafs, the purification of the soul. And how do we do this purification of the soul? How can you and I be inspired to do this purification of the soul? On the first level, Allah mentions that I have given you some ability to know and distinguish between right and wrong. But that's not sufficient. You need more help. And that's why Allah says about the Holy Prophet, that it is he who sent the prophet from amongst you to teach you the signs, to recite to you the signs. The same root word here, right? To purify you, to help you to be a source of inspiration, a guideline for you to look at on how to purify yourself. The prophet helps you and I do that. And of course, Imam Ali Islam and the rest of the Ahlul Bayt follow in line because they are reflectors and mirror images of the Prophet. So we look at them as inspiration on how to do this purification, this tazkiyah to nafs. And if you examine really this nafs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and I, we and I are so honored that Allah says that within this nafs, ruhi, that I've breathed into you my spirit. The spirit, of course, when Allah says my spirit, it's not part of him, but he honors this spirit, this capacity he has placed within us to reach him so much. He refers and refers it to himself, says my spirit, I've breathed it into you. And this existence of ours as human beings, Allah has placed us and given us many faculties to grow towards him. We know we have, for example, Quwwat al-Aqaliya, the four major faculties we know about. Quwwat al-Aqaliya, the power of intellect. Quwwat al-Ghadabiya, power of anger. Quwwat al-Shahwiya, the power of desires, and Quwwat al-Wahmiya, the power of creativity and imagination. All four major faculties that Allah has placed within you and I 
all four essential and crucial towards, towards our existence and functioning as human beings. But the most important point is the intellect must govern the rest of these powers. For if the other powers overcome the intellect, then you and I ourselves are doing ourselves an injustice. And that's why I'll quote one beautiful saying from Imam Ali you know, they say that once a companion of Imam Sadiq came to him and he asked the Imam, you know, who is greater, the angels or the human being? And Imam Sadiq quoted from his grandfather, Imam Ali that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created three types of creations. One is the angels, which is the world of spirits, and they have been given intellect, but no desire. Then he has created the world of animals, where they have been given desire, but no intellect. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also created the third type of creation, which is the human being, which has been given a combination of intellect and desire. And hence, because these two sort of opposing forces exist within the human being, the human being that takes his intellect and conquers his desires and lets the intellect govern his existence becomes superior in the eyes of God and the angels. But the one who lets his desires govern his existence despite having the intellect lowers himself even below the beasts and the animals. And that's what Allah says about such individuals. All of these various characteristics Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, but then he concludes, They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have hearts, but they can't comprehend. They are like cattle? No. They are worse than cattle. They are the heedless because at least the cattle doesn't have the intellect and the various capacities that Allah has instilled within this nafs. But you and I having these faculties, when we still go away, then Allah says, you are worse than the cattle. And hence this struggle, this jihad and nafs is extremely important. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal insan, inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan fa mulaqi. That, O oh mankind, you must struggle towards your Lord, a hard struggling kadhan fa mulaqi. Until you meet him. The way Imam alayhi salam constantly struggling the jihad and nafs and the external jihad constantly struggling for the sake of Allah, never satisfied, never complacent, famulaqi, until the final moment, the final days of his life when he's struck on the head, then he proclaims, and only then, that now that my time has come, fultu rabbil Kaaba, that surely by the Lord of the Kaaba, I have been successful. And this is the model you and I need to follow, the inspiration you and I need to take from on how to do the struggle towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, as always, uh, we are honored to have other panelists also joining in uh, on this discussion. We are pleased today to have uh, Sister Manal joining us once again. Also have Sister Sonia joining us um, from Europe, actually. And actually, I will let uh, Sister Sonia, inshallah, begin and make some introductory comments. As you know, actually, Sister Sonia um, is uh, an individual who was not born in the Shia school of thought. And it's befitting we have her during these nights because she takes inspiration, she took inspiration from the life of Imam Ali salam, and that is in fact one of the things that brought her um, to this uh, school of thought. So I'll let her begin inshallah and share, share some of her thoughts and her story inshallah. Thank you very much. I um, hope you can hear me okay. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, peace be upon you all. Thank you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting me this opportunity of joining you during these very blessed nights and sharing in the commemoration of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And I'm just going to briefly talk about, I realise it's a panel discussion and um, my story is quite a long one, but I'll keep it quite brief, inshallah. And it was about learning the beautiful life of Imam Ali that's really started my spiritual journey and led me towards the path of Ahlul Bayt, alhamdulillah. I was very blessed to be raised by um, parents who are so caring and they always encouraged us towards um, seeking knowledge and questioning and always being open-minded and they were very passionate campaigners for causes of justice and they instilled this into us in a, at a young age and I think this helped us tremendously later on and I followed them into a career of medicine and um, alhamdulillah I was very blessed to have a very rewarding job um, but my life for a long time was very material um, very luxurious I had everything that I really needed but I always felt that there was something missing, missing, missing 
everything uh, in my heart and I couldn't quite figure out what it was that I was missing. Um, so sadly, um, my father, who'd been really fit and well, he was my scuba diving buddy, we did a lot of things together, became very sick and died within a very short space of time. We were all with him in the hospital and I just watched on and I was a doctor, there was nothing we could do. And I saw his soul depart and it really became reality that this is the this is the this is our life that we're here for a short time we're going to move on and it was really inconceivable that this life um really didn't have any kind of purpose i knew that it had to have a purpose and i really prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me find it and in these um holy nights we pray for all our parents our loved ones those are who are with us now and those who have passed away as well inshallah and um and basically, at that time, I decided I had to research and try and figure out what the truth was. Before my uh, father passed away, my parents had collected, they were truth seekers and, and always wanting to learn more, and they collected a huge library of books. And I really started, uh, it was a really dark time for me. I had a baby who was three months old, and I just kept wanting to read and learn, and for the sake of myself, for the sake of my children. And they'd collected many historical books, books from um, non-Muslims writing about Islam to really have an objective lens. One of the first books that I actually read was one by um, a Christian author called George Jordak, um, called The Voice of Human Justice. And it was all about Imam Ali, Ali Salam. And I really didn't know anything about Imam Ali apart from the fact that he was one of the caliphs, that he was a uh, cousin of um, the Holy Prophet, and um, this really opened my eyes to what an amazing personality um, this man was, that he was born in the Kaaba, he was raised in the lap of revelation, he was like a little baby camel following every footstep of the Holy Prophet and being taught by him. He was a champion of human rights hundreds of years before um, the UN brought out the ch Charter for Human Rights. And there was two things that were very profound for me at that time, reading about Imam Ali. When I looked at Islam and you sometimes saw Muslims who were um, doing acts of violence and things, and that all, I knew that Islam didn't teach that, but that always sat uneasy with me. But when you look at the life of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, you saw that even on the battlefield, he wanted to make peace. He wanted to bring his enemies towards the good. And only that would he fight if his enemies insisted that they had to, they wanted to continue to fight and he would even say that you have to start the fighting because I can only fight in self-defense and that was really profound for me and you've mentioned it already previously about Imam Ali's letter to Malik al which was another thing that really touched my heart it was really a tour de force promoting compassion and justice and rights all across society that the, the very forgotten, the poor, the oppressed, everybody was um, had a place. And um, Imam Ali says that people have two are of two types, they're either your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. And he also very much opposed tyrants and oppressors and dictators and hoarders that we see, you know, very prevalent around the world today. And it touched my heart because I thought, if only, uh, you know, inshallah, this is what we applied across the world. I can't even imagine what a different place the world would be if this is how we looked after everybody. Um, and it's really sad when I see so many politicians that, you know, try to bring some of these values and they're, they're smeared and they're, you know, by, by so many and by the elite and by the media. And it's really sad. And we really pray that Imam Mahdi um, Ajahn Farajan will come soon to help establish this um, justice around the world very soon, inshallah. Um, I went on to, to read about Imam Ali Islam, and, and there he was, he was in the Quran, in chapter 33, verse 33, as part of the Ahl Bayt, along with Lady Fatima, and Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and the Holy Prophet. These were the ones where impurity was kept away from, you know, the Holy Prophet prayed for impurity to keep, be kept away from them. These were the same um, noble souls in the event of Mubahala. These were the ones that we were wanting, that we were ordered to love, that the Prophet sought no reward, but love for my family. And Brother Hassanin's already mentioned about the verses where Imam Ali gives his ring when he's um, to a poor man when he comes in while he's praying. 
and that he saves the life of the prophet by sleeping in his bed, those who sell their souls for the pleasure of Allah. So really I saw nothing but virtue and goodness and piety in Imam Ali's life and the Athlo Bay as, as I continued to read more and more about their, their lives and I saw no inconsistency among them and the message that they were, they were giving. And I'm saying this really for, all for the benefit of those who may have been in the same place of the spiritual journey that I was to start with because probably a lot of the viewers are and inshallah this will be some help. And when the Pro Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, said, I leave behind two weighty things, the Quran and the Athlul Bayt, then I knew that my prayers, you know, when asking for guidance, what, what is my purpose? What should I be doing? That inshallah, this, these were the lives and this is my guidance, the Quran and the Athlul Bayt, that I should be following and for the sake of my children who are young children, that I wanted us, all of us to move together. And this is what would take us towards God, Allah Subhanahu and also to, towards felicity and ultimate success, inshallah. And really my journey as well, I just mentioned this very briefly, that um, my journey, as my journey continued and my commitment to myself, my children, that's what also led me towards um, a few years ago, I found myself in Michigan in the USA, which I'd never been, I didn't actually know where Michigan was, but we found our way across um, the Atlantic and that's when we met Brother Hassanain and we met Sister Manal and so many of the lovely people in the um, panel that have been sharing such um, beautiful stories every night. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with that and the others, inshallah, to be able to um, comment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Sonia, Thank for you, Sister sharing your uh, beautiful uh, journey towards the path of the Ahlul Bayt and how Imam Ali uh, inspired you and continues to inspire, inshallah. Sister Manal, uh, do you want to make some uh, brief uh, comments, inshallah? Sure. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so, Sister Sonia, thank you. That was beautiful. SubhanAllah, a lot of times when we're looking for spirituality, we look, if we look towards Imam Ali, we can find that spirituality. There's a saying that Imam Ali says um, it says, wisdom true knowledge is not in the skies for it to come down to you, nor is it in the earth to come up to you. Rather, it is within your heart. Improve your morality so that it appears for you. How do we improve our morality? The question becomes, what do we need to do in order to purify our heart, to purify our nafis? Um, there is a beautiful ayah in the Quran. It is in Surah At-Tawbah, ayah 103. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Take, O Muhammad, from their wealth a charity by which you purify them. Um, and in Arabic, there are two different words for purification. Both of them are mentioned in this verse. And make prayers upon them. Your prayers are tranquility for them. And Allah is all hearing all knowing. So one way to help us get to this morality that Imam Ali says is within us, one way to get um, to the enlightenment that we're looking for is to give in the way of charity. And Imam Ali was one of the best examples of given charity. So inshallah, we should try and see how much we are able to give and how truly we can follow in what Allah is asking us to do. Because another verse says, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhibbkum Allah. If you love me, Allah is saying, follow the Prophet and Allah will love you. In order to follow the Prophet, we need to go to Imam Ali. Because like we said yesterday, babuha. So in order to get to the Prophet, we have to walk through the footsteps of Imam Ali. Um, and he beautifully showed us how to give sadaqah in order to um, have purification of the self. Thank you, Sister Manal. You know, one point of discussion that I want to open up, inshallah, Brother Snain, you can begin addressing on this, is when we talk about Imam Ali alayhi salam, the Holy Prophet, and all of these great personalities, how can we make it as such that we don't just look at them as some, you know, mantelpiece, as a showcase on our walls that we have you know, like the calligraphy of the imams or the prophets in our homes and not just revere them as the way we revere, you know, some Greek mytho mythological figures that, that, that we read about, you know, in history books, but how can we actually take them as practical examples and be inspired by them on a day-to-day -day level? 
No, very good question. In fact, another question we can also pose is that some people feel that when we praise Imam Ali alayhi salam, are we bre breaking the chain of justice on the basis that we're revering him too much? You know, there are people in the Muslim world who say, oh, you guys are always talking about Ahlul Bayt and you're praising Ahlul Bayt so much. You know, how important is that? So we can touch on that too in this dialogue. But look, uh, you find that our Prophet himself didn't like people who, who say things that they don't do. Quran even says, Lima taquluna, ma la taf'alun, right? So giving lip service to Allah even, even to praise Allah, you know, when Allah says, Wala in man samawati wal arda, Allah, right? They're answering correctly. When Allah says, and when they're asked, who created the sky and the earth, they say Allah. So they're not answering incorrectly, but notice the approach. Allah says, bal la Say glory be to Allah, but how few of them understand, right? Most of them don't understand, in other words. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, is saying that you cannot just give glory to God and not engage. So we cannot glorify the Prophet and the Imams without engaging in their footsteps. Even Quran says, as Sister Manal just quoted, right? So Allah says that if you claim, and this is in Surah Al Imran, that if you claim to love Allah, then follow me, then God will love you. Then he will forgive and protect you from sin and for the past sins, right? So that's very important for us. So how do we get into that? Evaluate. Imam Ali alayhi salam said such and such at such and such a time. Why did he say this? Are you in awe of it? Are you touched by it? Do you feel amazed by that behavior? Then apply yourself and say, can I do that? Well, very difficult. Have you seen anybody else do that? When you evaluate, you start to recognize a beautiful person. Many a times we've inherited these statements. We praise Imam Ali in a ritual fashion because we inherited that. That was what my problem was. You know, when I was a teenager, we always praised Ahlul Bayt. My mother always told me about stories of Ahlul Bayt, Imam Ali Alayhi Salam especially. I was very touched. But at the age of, the, you know, the teenage, you start to question, you're wondering, is this all true? Maybe this is all just made up because you're also among non-Muslims and you're seeing their behaviors and you're wondering, where do I stand in the spectrum of good? And these people who are not Muslims, are they that bad? Do they have to be this way? And if they are okay, not praying and drinking alcohol and not fasting and believing in something else, then why do I need to believe in this? Why is this important? You know, these are kind of questions we all ask as we grow up. And I realized that the more I assessed and analyzed, especially in my university years, I started to study other religions. I started to study their leaders, their people, their scriptures. You know, and especially those beings that were not shared in the Quran, you know, the prophets like Abraham, Moses, Joseph, uh, Jacob, these were all shared in the Quran. So I knew how to lay the foundation. But personalities that were not mentioned in the Quran, who some religions revere. So I would go to those people and say, okay, let's look at this person. This religion really reveres this person, consider this person to be really good. Let me see where's the value of this person. And when you read it, you find it's very shallow, with all due respect. In fact, some of these people who were revered were murderers. They murdered people. They actually killed people. And now they're revered as agents of God. Like I'm holding my hands on my head like, what? So you can be like an ex-murderer and be considered an agent of God? Is that the principle? God allows that? And they said, yeah, of course. God is very loving. I said, oh my God. I thought the world was confusing. You just doubled it. Because now I have no idea what is wrong and right. Because you just mixed it all up. I have no focus. I have no GPS. I have no idea what is right. Because all wrong can become right and all right can become wrong. So let's just all stop talking about morals and, and values. And the more I looked at that, not in a, in a condescending way to put down religions. No, not at all. I think that would be a wrong approach. But rather just to lay the basic foundations to say, if I was a non-Muslim, if I was not a follower of Ahlul Bayt, would I like this being? And it was just amazing. So I think to answer your question very briefly, brother, uh, I think it's very important to evaluate. We cry for Imam Hussein and we fight. 
I remember, I, would, look, I don't like to bring this up because it's negative energy, but Ashura night, people are fighting. You're doing Latmiya this way, I do it this way, or I do it this way. I don't like you, you do this, I don't like you, so I'm gonna fight with you. And I'm thinking, Subhan I was a teenager at that time saying, SubhanAllah, Imam Hussein went to Karbala, gave his whole family, so you guys can fight on how to beat yourself? Like, is that what Imam came for? We are so misplaced. How about Salah time? We, we are crying for Imam Hussein and it's Adhan time. Adhan time. And they're not praying on the streets of Madison Avenue. <clears throat> and I'm saying, okay, uh, why aren't you praying? Oh, we love Imam Hussein. I said, do you know who he is? Yeah, of course, mashallah. I said, he died praying on the battlefield. Hello. He told the enemy to stop attacking so he could pray. And you guys are now commemorating him and you stop praying? You know how insulting it is to our Imam that you stop praying just to praise him? This is insulting. So what I'm saying is, and it's not only among us, Christians have it. Christians put so much emphasis on Christ. Christ fasted. Jesus prayed. He put his face on the ground. He fasted for 40 days. It's in the Bible. And I said to them, why don't you put your face on the ground? Oh, well, it's a different story now. I said, so this man who's your leader has become the cart and you've become the horse. That's the problem. So I think we should evaluate and look carefully and then follow. Follow and place the value where it belongs and you will see amazing things. Thank you, Brother Hassanain. Um... Alhamdulillah, I think we've had a very interesting discussion today on, you know, leveraging and looking at the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam and using it as inspiration for this struggle of the self and our personal spiritual journeys. And of course, there's, as always, there's much to discuss and much to talk about, but in a very limited time. So inshallah, we will all share some um, brief final thoughts before Brother Hassanain uh, uh, concludes. Um, Sister Sonia, would you like to begin? Thank you. Just talking about the practical application of all that we learn into our lives. For me, um, my main roles are as a mother and as a, as a doctor and really sort of learning about the apple bait, trying to apply it into my life. It was about, you know, taking the ordinary job that I do and taking it to the next level, keeping in mind the apple bait, um, trying to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can I be a better mother, make sure that I'm nurturing uh, taking my care of my children the best I can, teaching them as much as I can, imparting as much knowledge. And then also in my role um, in medicine as well, um, I've not had um, been able to stay in so much um, because of all the, the, the work that we're doing just now. Um, but it's been very rewarding and very blessed that, um, you know, although we've not had the time to reflect and connect, we're be able to go out and serve um, the people. And it's a very tense time, particularly for patients that are coming to hospital and how can we make that easier? Um, and inshallah, that, that's what we've been trying to do to really make it as, as best an, an experience for our patients and with kindness and care and love as much as we possibly can. Um, Imam Ali Islam said, ask me, ask me before you lose me. And we really mourn his loss, but it's very important to try and hold on to all the treasures, the beautiful treasures that, that Imam Ali and the Athlo Bay have left behind so many beautiful works. And I was briefly going to mention the will of, last will of Imam Ali Islam. Um, I know Brother Hassanay is going to talk about it in future, but it's certainly something that's worth um, looking up um, in advance because it's another beautiful work full of gems of guidance. And I really want to just thank you all for inviting me. Um, because I haven't had as much time to engage um, because of what's been going on, um, this has really helped energize me and uh, Jazakallah khair, and thank you very much again. Can I just jump in? I just want to make a quick comment. Sister Sonia is, as you know, is in Scotland, is in Glasgow. Um, and we're, we're really, really honored to have you. I mean, you have no idea how honored we are when you come and visit us at the camp. To me, when we talk about when Brother Amil asked, you know, how do we follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt? I mean, with all due respect, without patronizing this panel and the panels that have been with us, in my opinion, I'm a witness to the fact that every one of them is working hard to follow the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt system. And I'll make sure her whole family, in fact, her extended family from around the world comes in the, in the summer times. For what reason? To inspire our spiritual 
uh, needs and for our children to be put in the right environment. You know, and I remember Sister, uh, um, Sister Sonia had to go to the UK just to go get the, to London actually, just to get a visa to come to the US. And she made sure she got the visa just to bring her kids to, to camp. So we're truly honored, Sister. And you are on the front lines, as you know, you are the first responder, you're a physician, you're an anesthesiologist, and you're highly exposed to this contagion COVID. And we pray for you. We pray for your safety, for you are the one who's saving lives. And what, what can we say when we have this discussion about following the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt? What can we say about people like you? Enough said for the evidence speaks for itself. So may Allah reward you and protect you and your family, Sister Manal, the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Hassanain, for uh, sharing those uh, remarks. And indeed, uh, we do see the resonance of the Ahlul Bayt in, in the actions uh, of such individuals. Alhamdulillah, Sister Manal, please. Um, yeah, Alhamdulillah, thank you very much. Um, the only way we can actually follow in the footsteps of Imam Ali is to become more learned about him. If we don't know him, we can say that we love him as much as we want, but if we don't look at his life, look at his sayings, try to follow it, it's very difficult. One thing I try to do in my daily life is sort of like the WWJD, what would Jesus do that Christians um, talk about? Um, it's really, what would Imam Ali do in a situation? Would he act this way? Would he react this way? Um, sometimes we are not as firm as we need to be in situations where Imam Ali would stand firm when you're standing up for justice. Sometimes we are too firm in situations where we need to be more lenient, especially when we're working with um, people of faith or people that might not have knowledge. So knowing more about Imam Ali and how he dealt with so many different situations we can talk about Imam Ali for years and not truly grasp this phenomenal personality that Allah was so mercifully sent to all of humankind. It wasn't just for the Muslims. It wasn't just for the Shia. It truly was for everybody that has an ounce of humanity and stands up for justice. Um, this is after the prophet, peace be upon him, he is the most valuable role model that we can take. And unfortunately, we've come to a point in time where our role models are role models, but they're role models for the wrong reason. They're role models for having worldly possessions possibly, but they don't have anything else. Imam Ali didn't have a lot of worldly possessions, but what need do we have of worldly possessions when we possess um, a role model that possesses the knowledge um, to say at the end of his journey, Fistu wa Rabbul Kaaba. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Manal. You know, I just want to share one a final story on Imam, of Imam Ali alayhi salam, you know, on the point that Sister Sonia mentioned that in the letter that Imam alayhi salam wrote to Malik al Ashtar, he wrote that, you know, that man is either your, you know, there are two categories, either your brother in faith or your equal in humanity. And they say that when Imam alayhi salam was the caliph, um, when he eventually was granted that position because the people begged him to become the leader. They say that one day he was walking in the streets with some of his companions and he noticed a beggar on the side of the street. And so he asked uh, the people, you know, who is this man? And they said, oh, this is a Christian man. And he's, he's a beggar on the side of the street. He, he can no longer work. And so he's here begging on the streets. So Imam alayhi salam looked at his companions and he said, you, the Muslim community, used him, used his work while he was young. And now that he's become old, you just let him, you know, to, to rot on the street. And Imam alayhi salam, you know, honored the man and gave him and assigned him a salary from the Bayt al-Man the same way that the Muslims were given a salary. This is the type of justice and the type of character of Imam Ali alayhi salam that we're talking. And this is why, you know, we truly remember him because he resonates and exemplifies the mercies of the, uh, the, the mercies and principles of the Quran and the mercy and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were found manifested in this great man. Inshallah, Brother Hassanin, you will conclude on this note. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you all as panelists um, and all those who've been attending and all the audiences that have been attending. And our goal, as you know, is to, is to spread this message of unity and love and harmony with the right kind of leadership. Because I think what the world is lacking, as Sister Manal touched on and even Sister uh, Sonia touched on, is that we're lacking good leadership, right? Brother Amil also touched on that. We lack good leadership. We need good leadership. Leadership is very important. 
And if we realign ourselves in the right leadership, inshallah, humanity will start to resonate in that direction. So I really want to thank all of you for, for your participation. And I want us all to pray for each other, especially in these nights of Ramadan, in the nights of Qadr, for everybody's in need of prayers. And people are going through a lot of problems and anxieties on one side, and then there's a silver lining on the other side where people are now getting out of their cocoons, are getting out of their slumber, are getting out of their foggy moments and getting clarity with their loved ones and their children and their economics and so on. So there's always this flip side to everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. And I think we need to take um, instruction from that. And I think Imam Ali alayhi salam gives us a very good instruction and I advise us all to read the Nahjul Balagha. There are historical events, how he wrote letters to Muawiyah, how he wrote letters to people who are his friends and his enemies. And this is very important for if you and I want to understand Islam, you and I have to take those lessons and to put light in, in with regards to what really happened, what was the real scenario of that time. Why? Because if you and I want to hold on, as we've mentioned, to the ways of Allah and feel the energy and the synergy of the Imams, you've got to read. Okay, reading is extremely important. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says something really, uh, you know, very beautiful. He says, it is about divine dispensation. Imam says that whoever sets right his inward self, meaning if there is one conversation we can never escape, all this talk about prophets, imams, the greatness, the Quran, the verses, if the inner self is not willing to listen to it and absorb it, it's just going to be what we call masmu. Al-ilmu ilman, the Imam Ali says, there are two kinds of knowledge. Okay, there's masmu or matbu, the one you hear which passes you and the one you absorb. And Imam says there is no benefit to that which you hear. Only benefit with knowledge is that which you absorb. But absorption doesn't come if the heart is not willing to absorb. So the heart must be willing. Allah says, Who will listen to you? The one who is conscious, the one who is aware. The one who is arrogant, the one whose ears, eyes, hearts are sealed. They are the ones who, they are, they, their system is closed no matter what you say to them. So we are addressing to each other, how do we expand our chest? How do we expand our hearts to get closer to Allah in this blessed month? How do we become spiritual? And Imam Ali al says something very beautiful. He says, whoever sets right his inward self, Allah sets right his outward self. Just think about it. If you and I just worry about my inner and constantly say, I need to become a better person, Allah will make my outer better, naturally. Because what emanates from the inside is what ultimately shows on the outside. We no longer have to practice hypocrisy. We can be sincere. And I must say, you know, as, even as a public speaker, many a times you speak very complicated issues. Sometimes, you know, you bring very complicated issues. Many people are not listening to the complicated issue. They're listening to the sincerity of the delivery. Is the heart sincere when he's talking to me? Does it have the resonance of truth? When you and I look deep within ourselves and purify ourselves at the heart level, not at the mind level, a lot of talk today in academics is at the mind level, neuro-linguistic programming, it's all here. We train our kids to be smart here. No, we must train our kids to be smart through here to here. Through this to this, through this to this. If it doesn't get here, nothing. Trust me, not even a little rain, even a downpour will not bring any growth. Then Imam Ali alayhi salam says, whoever performed acts for his religion, maintain salah. This advice I give us, you know, Sayyid Khuy rahmatullahi was asked, I'm having problems, my business is not going well, no matter what I do. Sayyid Khuy said, how? He said, looked at the person, said, do you pray? He said, yes, I pray. He said, when do you pray? He said, I delay it. He said, that's your problem. Pray on time. When it's adhan, get ready. Wait and look at the watch. When is the adhan? Get ready. Get ready to move. Within that first 10, 15 minutes of adhan, move. Because the minute you say, well, I've got four hours, it's going to go. 
And what's going to happen is you're going to be the last second, and maybe it's going to become qada. So Allah say, Imam Ali salam says, whoever performs acts for his religion, Allah accomplishes his acts of this world. Meaning Allah makes our things go easy. Fatima to Zahra alayha, was doing tasbih. The Prophet gave her the tasbih. She had difficulty doing chores for her children. And the Prophet gave her this tasbih. It's known as tasbih to Zahra. We'll talk about it some other time. And as she's doing Allahu Akbar, I want you to just imagine dhikr. You have Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah. Many times, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. No. Allahu Akbar is the initial recognition of the greatness of God. Alhamdulillah, you are in it now, you're swimming. You, Allahu Akbar, you saw the ocean. Alhamdulillah, you dove in it. And then you start to feel the real, you merge with the universe, you become Subhanallah. That 34, 33, 33, every time is a dhikr that should take you to another dimension. Many times, Allah, 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 Allah we put the tasbih back. We haven't done it. It's like saying, hi, how are you? And you walk away. You didn't look at the person. You didn't pay attention. You didn't monitor. You didn't feel the resonance of the person. What happens? You say, hi, goodbye. Who was that person? I don't remember. I saw somebody. That's how we do tasbih. Salah is like that too for us. Let's indulge. And Allah, Imam Ali salam says, if you do the deeds towards Allah, Allah takes care of your deeds. Wow, that's deep. Whoever's dealings between himself and Allah are good, Allah turns the dealing between him and other people good. So if my dealing with Allah is good, God makes my dealings with people good. What is our biggest problem in the world? Dealing with people. If I ask any person, what's your problem today? Oh, such and such a person is backbiting me. Such and such a person is gossiping me. This and such, such and such a person stole from me. Such and such a person is jealous of me. You notice, what's our biggest problem in the world? Ask eight and a half billion people, what's your problem? It's somebody doing something wrong to somebody. Here, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, when you are good to Allah, Allah will make you good with the people. So tonight I end on this. Very, very important that while Imam Ali alayhi salam is leaving this world and he is now talking to the people and there were two conversations that he had. He had the conversation in his family and we'll talk about it tomorrow. This is the general one in Sermon 149. It's amazing. Imam says that, and this is his last, I mean, this is before his, his martyrdom and there are points in here that are very deep and I'll just touch on it briefly before we end. He says, oh people, everyone shall meet what he wishes to avoid by running away. Imam says, the death which you run away from, it will meet you. It will meet you. Then you will return to your Lord who is known, who knows the unseen. He says, death is the place to which life is driving. If you ever want to conquer life, you must conquer death. You must understand it. You must realize it's imminent. You must know there's a day of judgment. When you conquer that, you conquer this world. If you avoid those, what I mean by is to come to terms with it, to know that I will die, to know that when I go to the graveyard and I bury somebody who I love, know that maybe you're next. If we don't go through that movement, then we are living a lie. Imam says to run away means to catch it. How many days did I spend in searching for the secret of this matter? Imam is describing. I'm speaking, I'm reciting this. In, but Allah did not allow save its concealment, meaning the day of the death. It's concealed. Allah is merciful when he conceals it. Because now we can live. If we knew the death date, many of us would not be able to manage it. Only prophets and imams knew when they were going to die. So Allah, Allah says he concealed it. And it is a treasured knowledge. The day of your death. No self knows on which land they will die. God knows it. Imam says, and as for my last will, it is that concerning Allah. SubhanAllah, I'm thinking this is a man whose poison is seeping into his head. He's about to leave. And he's concerned about leaving me something of a gem, as I mentioned in my monologue initially that what he says before he leaves should stay in our hearts forever. Because that's profound. That's like summary of his whole 63 years. He's putting it in front of us. He says, for my last will, it is that concerning Allah, 
do not, do not believe in a partner to him. Do not associate anyone with him. لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم. And concerning the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do not disregard his sunnah. Maintain his sunnah. Do not disregard his sunnah. What he did and what he didn't do. What he loved and what he did not love is what you should do. Period. Nothing else. Atiu Allah wa atiu Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Keep these two pillars, Imam says, and burn these two lamps, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Burn them till you are not divided, meaning these two don't divide. No evil will come to you. If you maintain these two, no evil will come to you. Shaitan cannot touch you. You will become impenetrable. You and I all want security. We don't want Iblis to fool us. We don't want the evildoers to fool us. Imam says, that's the secret, right there. Every one of you has to bear his own burden. Nobody shall bear the burden of the other. You are liable, Allah says. And on that day, your heart should come calm with Salim, Qalbin Salim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us. It has been kept light for the ignorant, meaning for the ignorant, this doesn't exist. It's light. They don't care. Does, they don't care. Allah is merciful. Faith is straight. It's Sirat al Mustaqim. You know, when we, when we say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, it's Rasulullah. It's Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Allah describes Sirat al Ladina Na'amta alayhim. He's talking about that. He says, Faith is straight. The leader who is the Prophet is the holder of knowledge. Yesterday, listen to this very carefully, because we as a human race have the same problem. We judge people negatively, and then we honor them when they die. But when they were alive, we didn't give them the credit they deserved. And my God, if there is a person who was denied that credit in his lifetime, and even after his life, it's Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Wallahi, I say this. I say I have never seen a man who has been so unfairly judged, yet he wants nothing but for our security. He says, when Ibn Muljim struck him, he says, I want to be his friend, but he wants to kill me. He says, yesterday I was with you. Today I've become the object of a lesson for you. And tomorrow I shall leave you. I swear, if I was there when you said that to me, my heart would stop. May Allah forgive me and you, Iman says. If the foot remains firm in this slippery place, so be it. Well and good. But if the foot slips, this is because we're under the shade of branches, meaning that if we are slipping, if we are, if they, if we are firm with our deen, alhamdulillah, it's good for us. If we slip, because we are too covered. We have too many blessings, Imam Ali alayhi salam says. Whose layers are dispersed in the sky and whose traces disappear in the earth. Listen to this. I was your neighbor. My body kept you company for some days. And shortly you will find just an empty body of mine, which would be stationary after all. All its movements and silent after the speech. And that my calmness the closing of my eyes and the stillness of my limbs may provide you counsel that it will be a lesson. How many dead people I have seen who are nowhere near Imam Ali alayhi salam and I wondered who this person was. Or when this person was alive, how little I took care of this person or how little I paid attention to this person. Because it is more of a counsel for those who take a lesson from it than eloquent speech. Think about it. Imam says all this eloquent speech is not as powerful as seeing a lifeless body, especially of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says in a ready word, I am departing from you like the one who is eager to meet someone. I'm leaving you. I'm going. Tomorrow you will look at my days. Then my inner side will be disclosed to you. And you will understand me after the vacation of my place and its occupation by someone else. You know, I end with this and we'll talk about this tomorrow. Imam Hassan is standing there. Imam Hussein is there. Zainab is there. Kusum is there. Abbas is there. The grandchildren are there. 
some of them. And Imam is looking at everyone. If there's one thing that strikes me the hardest is his wisdom was so great that he knew exactly what will happen to Imam Hassan. He knew exactly what will happen to Imam Hussein. He knew exactly what will happen to Zainab And he went through that pain to bury his blessed wife, Fatima to Zahra, that he cried so much when he buried Fatima He cried so much, for there was no man on earth who could bury Fatima to Zahra except Amir al-Mu'mineen. You know, when you and I leave this world, you are worrying about what have I left behind? Have I left a, a nest egg? Do I have, have I left something for my family? Have I left things, material things? Are they going to be happy? Can you imagine Imam is leaving them knowing that Imam Hassan will be given poison and he will die? And he knows Abbas's arms will be cut off and he will become Shaheed in Karbala. And he knows Zainab is going to be dragged city to city, displayed in public as a slave, as a prisoner. What father can leave this world on this deathbed and give these kinds of blessings to us while he knows this lies awaiting for them for his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that his whole generation is going to pay a price with him least. Huh? That he knows Hussein is his beautiful son Hussein, that his head will be severed from his body and his body will be crushed with horses. I ask us all, Fatima also knew this that when she was in sujood, make sujood, that she's making sujood and her soul is leaving. My thought today is painting me. Imagine the father who knows that this is my child, like Imam Hussein salam, leaving the tent and going forward when he knows his little four-year-old Rukaya is holding on to him and says, Baba, don't go. But he knows soon she will die. Soon she will join him from prison. A four-year-old. This kind of zulam cannot go with words. No. It must seep into our hearts and we must hold the banner. We must not be afraid of injustice. We must not be afraid of people who do wrong. We must love humanity. For I say if my imam has given this kind of sacrifice that I cannot even process mentally what the pain he has gone through. Shame on me 1400 years later if I don't follow that footstep. For I know of nobody who has sacrificed more in the universe than these people. Shame on us on judgment day when Allah says, I gave you the finest. So I advise us all and I say this to myself. Let's purify the self. Let's forgive each other. Let's love each other. And let's love them the way Amir al Mu'mineen loved people, the widows, the orphans, the poor. The simplicity, the purity of maintaining wisdom and the words of wisdom. You and I must gain knowledge, acquire it. Imam says, What's wrong with you, mankind? Gain knowledge. Come on. I end on this. May Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah, that we all move in that direction so that Allah grants us this high station of paradise. I pray for every one of you. You pray for us, you pray for me. For this one thing I want the whole world, the whole world. When I see somebody doing something wrong, even our crazy president, I pray for him. I said, oh Allah, give this man hidayah. Take him out of this slumber. Take him out of this narcissism. Give him hidayah. Maybe let him one day wake up one morning and realize, oh my God, what am I doing? But alas, some people just will never change, will they? But you and I should never stop praying for them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم وآخر دعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين We're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us the way he had mercy on our predecessors and we ask Allah not to put any hatred between us and people ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return our Imam among us so that this justice is established the way Amir al-Mu'mineen struggled, the way Imam Hassan struggled, the way Imam Hussein struggled, the way all the remaining Imams struggled. And I pray to Allah that we are witnesses to this. I pray to Allah that we are there. I pray to Allah that we are party to this. I pray to Allah that we are 
working to establish it for that cause. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us. For even if he doesn't and we leave this world, it doesn't matter. For Allah is witness that this is what we prayed for. That's what matters, inshallah. We will be doing, inshallah, a'mal tomorrow, live a'mal after the shahad of Imam Ali alayhi salam on the 21st. We ask you to join us, inshallah. And after this program tonight, we will pray. We will play a short ziyarat of Aminullah. It's really nice of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Uh, and may Allah bless you all for joining us. Really, it's been fantastic. And this is a miracle with this situation where the world is connected and we're all sharing our spirits together. May Allah give us the tawfiq, inshallah, to continue to do this. Wassalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.